Hello, and welcome to Your Art Sucks, a podcast dedicated to helping artists create better art. And this is episode six, Horrible Deals, The Rolling Stones and Neil Gaiman. In this episode, we'll have a look at two artists who found themselves in legal situations that severely impacted their creativity, their reputations, and more importantly, their livelihoods. This episode will highlight the many serious problems artists can experience when the business side of the creative process is not given full focus. As I've mentioned in previous episodes, artists and lawyers rarely make good collaborations. And when it comes to forcing an artist to produce work, things can get really ugly really fast. It has, for some, been a death spiral that's left them broke and powerless to fight back. I have no doubt that this episode will be a wake-up call to any artist who enters into such situations lightly. As valuable as you think you and your art are, there are sharks around every corner just waiting to take what you have and tie you up in litigation until you're penniless. Now before you think you're above such potential legal pitfalls, think again. The goal of every artist is to sell their work, correct? Whether that sale constitutes a painting, a song, a performance, a design, a sculpture. It all comes down to a two-way transaction, a seemingly rudimentary financial agreement between a buyer and a seller. But no matter how simple the process may seem, each of us is held to the rules and regulations of the jurisdiction we reside in. And in any dispute, no matter how minuscule, that arises from this transaction, it can eventually land an artist in court, or worse, in jail. Now to me, nothing sounds as unartistic and uninspired and as soul-robbing as rambling about contracts. So, I get the lack of interest. But this episode will show you how vital it is to keep both eyes on your business at all times. So let's get to the show and see what we can learn from these artists. Before I get into the utter mess that dragged the Rolling Stones down for decades... I wanted to talk to you about a lesser-known musician who provided the impetus for this show. While researching bad music deals, I came across a very intriguing piece about a singer-songwriter who signed a record deal that almost cost him his life. I decided to add this story into the episode because it has the makings of a Martin Scorsese movie. But sadly, it also highlights crimes in the music business that have never really vanished. Singers and bands, to this day are fleeced of millions of dollars because of the shady and downright illegal practices we see. If you're naive, like Tommy James was, then there are many lined up to take you down the garden path to ruin. Some of you may be saying, Tommy who? Yeah, well, that's what I said too. Well, to fill you in, Tommy James is an American singer-songwriter who in the 1960s was with a rock band called Tommy James and the Shondells. Now you're saying again, who? Now, while you may not know Tommy or his band, you have most likely heard the songs they perform first. Songs like Money Money, ultimately made popular by Billy Idol. Now, Tommy has a co-writing credit on that song. I Think We're Alone Now, a huge success in the 1980s for singer Tiffany. Crimson and Clover, or maybe Dragon the Line. These songs have had millions of plays on radio and continue to have visibility on the web. If you look on YouTube, Tommy's performance of Moni Moni has over 6.2 million views. But back in the early days of his career, when views were hard to come by, Tommy was eager to ink a deal that would allow him to pursue his creative career full-time. This desperation, and his obvious talent, was just the right mix that so many corrupt record labels thrived on. The 50s and 60s were awash in predators looking to use and discard any singer or group who showed a whiff of talent, and there were thousands of artists that paid the price for their greed. As for Tommy, his deal was different, and not in a good way. In the late 60s, after the Shondells, well, what was left of the original band, which was basically Tommy at this point, they had a bit of a hit records on their hand in Pittsburgh, and they decided the next step in their career was to head to New York. The group made the rounds of the major record labels, they got some initial potential offers from some of the companies they visited. One label, Roulette Records, gave no initial response because its head, Morris Levy, he was out of town until evening. By next morning, 
the Shondells, and Tommy were now receiving polite refusals from the same major record companies that were showing such enthusiasm for the record just a day before. James said, we didn't know what in the world was going on. And finally, Jerry Wexler over at Atlantic Records, he leveled with us and said, look, Morris Levy and Roulette, they called up all the record companies and told us, this is my freaking record. And he scared everybody away, even the big corporate labels. So now Tommy and the Shondells, their only option would be to sign with Roulette. Now you would think that Tommy, after hearing that Roulette basically threatened everyone within the industry, would have paused for, for maybe a second and, you know, had some thought about it. But no, he happily signed on without doing any due diligence. Now you know what's coming, don't you? Well, hold on a minute because it actually gets worse than what you think. For clarity's sake, let's call Roulette what it was. It was basically a front for the Genovese crime family. And while we're at it, let's call Roulette's front man, Morris Levy, what he was. Here's a quote from the website All Music that sums it up. Levy was a notorious crook who swindled artists out of their owed royalties. He was widely known for falsely taking writing credit in order to receive royalties, enriching himself at the expense of many of his signed artists, especially R&B artists. And Tommy... Well, Tommy and the Shondells were his victims as well. One would think that not getting paid royalties and being strong-armed to give writing credits to songs would be bad enough. But as I mentioned, it did get worse. When the Gambino crime family decided to take over New York, the Genovese and any places they owned were considered fair targets. Now Roulette, with the multi-million dollars it was generating each year, and Tommy, interestingly enough, was responsible for about 30 to $40 million of that profit, which he never saw, it was of serious interest to the Gambinos. So now, hearing that Morris Levy split town, the record label was basically in the hands of the artists. And after a call from the Shondell's lawyer telling Tommy to get the hell out of New York, he decided it was time to remove himself from the situation. If the warning didn't come when it did, Tommy's career may have been a hell of a lot shorter. Fortunately for him, after decades of abuse, he's finally seeing some of that money come back to him. But the tale is only one in a thousand, spanning decades in the industry. I shudder to think of the artists who generated millions of dollars like Tommy, but who were never paid, and whose names we just never hear of. But what if your name is one that is legendary in the annals of music history? What if you're a band who sold over a hundred million albums and are members of the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame? Could you fall victim to a bad deal? Well, the short answer is obviously yes. And the Rolling Stones, at one time, you could have cast them in the part of Trilby in George DeMarie's 1895 novel about a, a girl who's basically hypnotized into singing by a Svengali. But who played the role of Svengali? Well, in this case, it was played by superstar manager Alan Klein. In order to set the stage for how the Stones came to work with Alan, we must take a quick look at where both of them were before this fateful relationship took shape. Now, Alan Klein, he was working his way up through the industry to become a bit of a legend. You see, his thing was to help musicians regain royalties they were screwed out of. And yeah, interestingly enough, he worked with artists who were signed by Roulette. He went against the mob and, and Morris Levy. We heard they were in serious trouble, but, you know, Alan, he stepped in and he got money for the artists. Now, his next successes came with the infamous soul singer Sam Cooke. He provided this artist with owed back royalties, control over his catalog, and a great contract with RCA. In 1965, he was seen as a true friend to the artist and a real pain in the ass to record companies. But this was far from the truth. Now, as for the Stones, the 60s were a time of multiplying record sales and exponential growth in fans and recognition. Their song Satisfaction in 1965 it was rocketing up the U.S. charts to sit on top for about four weeks. They were still a young band who, as their first manager, Andrew Oldham, already knew, well, the Stones were two things. They were supremely talented and dangerously naive when it came to finances. In 1967, Alan Klein had been co-managing the Stones with Oldham. But things were starting to come to the surface about Oldham that would lead Klein to buy him out and take full management. You see, Oldham had been shorting the stones of their royalties. And more importantly, 
he had control of the master tapes of all the early Stones catalog. So the band had their first taste of manipulation, and it didn't sit well. But while Alan Klein was viewed as their savior, this would be the band's second lesson in the world of business, and it would be a painful one. In the five years they were with Klein, the band would crumble. There would be drug charges for Keith Richards and growing tensions with Mick Jagger and the tragic loss of guitarist Brian Jones due to her drowning. It was only through sheer determination that the band would pull through. As for Alan, you would think that his role of manager would be to hold all these pieces together, but he took more of a distant view of the process. He was cold towards the band, and he spent far too much time neck deep in their finances. Behind the scenes, Klein would indeed be working for the band, though. He got them a new record deal with Decca Records, that was the band's label at the time, which provided them a 1.7 million pound advancement against future royalties. But how that money ended up in Alan Klein's U.S. bank account instead of the Stones' U.K. account? Well, that was a real mystery. Now sure, Klein got his hand caught in the cookie jar, but while the band was watching his right hand, Klein's left hand was ensuring that the band's entire music catalog ended up in his name only. A 10-year span of early Stones recordings was now in the sole ownership of Alan Klein, and there was nothing the band could do once they found out. It was just too late. Having had enough, both parties sat down in 1975 to hash out their details of this now mutual separation. But for the Stones, this parting would be a wound the band wouldn't be able to heal from for decades. Now during this sit-down, it did come up that Klein would have to pay some money to the Stones. Now, he was okay with that because basically what he did is he took about a million pounds of the Stones' royalty payments and he had it tied up in litigation. But they did get it. And Mick Jagger puts it this way. He says, All of this money? It was for songwriting royalties that he owed Keith and me from 1965 onward. I wasn't particularly happy about surrendering ownership of the original songs. I just wanted to get rid of them. He's just living off us, and what we did for five, ten years, you know? It's pretty pathetic. Such words would have hardly impacted Klein, though. He came out on top. He got their catalog, and on top of this, they still owed him an album. How's that for adding insult to injury? As for Klein's view of himself, it's pretty clear that he has no qualms about who or what he is. He says this about the lawsuits he's engaged in, and there's some pretty strong language ahead, so be warned. He says, nobody sues a failure. They only sue a success. I relish the reputation as the biggest bastard in the valley. Artists fuck groupies. And according to my reputation, I fuck the artists. I see little remorse in anything Alan did. As he moved on from the Stones to the Beatles, things would even get worse. There would be more lawsuits and more angles Alan would play to make himself one of the best at being one of the worst. I've put a link in the show notes to the short interview John Lennon did when he was asked about Alan. It's worth watching because he has a very uncomfortable reaction. You know, there's more he wants to say, but he kind of makes sure he doesn't say it. You know, to me, I would assume he's probably worried about getting sued. We both know Alan would have no problem in going down that road. So let's leave the shady world of music and have a look at the world of comics. It would seem a safe place, doesn't it? A one-time secluded world where artists had created iconic characters who've inspired millions to dream about fantastic worlds or superpowers and fighting crime. It's the epitome of good triumphing over evil. These heroes are ingrained in our culture. They've replaced the age mythos of Greek and Roman times and have shaped generations of people. And maybe these comics even pushed a few kids to try jumping off their rooftops with bath towels tied around their necks. You know, truly believing that for those few sweet seconds of airtime, that they could fly like Superman. And while I won't name names of those who were there when our friend broke his collarbone, we all learned a valuable lesson that day. We learned that one of us just didn't believe hard enough. I mean, that's why he fell from the sky, right? Well, I digress. I think most of us have had the pleasure of flipping through the long-awaited next installment of our favorite comic. The rush of seeing your favorite character explode off the page in full color, fighting for truth or saving people in dire need, 
oh, it's just electrifying. If you haven't had this pleasure, I urge you to visit a comic store and try it for yourself. With the box office successes that superheroes have now seen, you'd be ignorant to think that the comics that inspired these characters or their creators are lesser artists. Sure, there was a time when these artists were considered counter to the mainstream artistic pursuits. They weren't painters, they weren't sculptors, but such times have long since disappeared. Comics, with their deeply connected storylines and well-conceived characters, well, they've created vast content for both television and film, which has generated tens of billions of dollars. It's an industry that allows artists to create work that has the potential for unlimited wealth and a fan base that shows undying loyalty. I mean, what more could an artist ask for? Look at all the comic cons that are popping up all over the world. They're such dedicated fans. They're willing to dress up like their favorite characters. Now, I don't know about you, but I don't see people dressing up like Picasso or, you know, Jasper Johns just to go to a, an art con. I mean, it'd probably be great to see, but I don't think that'll ever happen. But as with the music industry, where the money flows, bad deals soon follow. Those looking to make a quick buck flood the comic book studios in search of the next blockbuster. But unlike musicians, though, writers and illustrators of comics, they have a strong grasp on the value of their work, and few of them end up losing control. Sure, it's happened. In fact, the creators of Superman, Jerry Siegel and Joe Shuster, well, they fought against Detective Comics in 1947. It was the first of many struggles to regain the rights of their beloved character. And the lessons learned at that time, well, they weren't forgotten by anyone in the industry. Unlike the music scene, these artists were aware of how to control their property. So when a story started to surface about an artist that had ripped off another artist in the same community, it seemed that there were still lessons that needed to be learned. And at the end of this one, the whole industry would benefit from the work of one lone crusader. And that crusader was author Neil Gaiman. But before we get to Neil, we need to talk about the other part of this story, Todd McFarland. When Todd McFarlane left Marvel to create another comic book publishing company, it was a shock to the industry. Todd had been extremely successful in re-energizing the Amazing Spider-Man series. Marvel treated Todd like a king, and there were legions of fans and other artists who dream of having his position. But Todd wanted more. Image Comics, founded in 1992 by Todd McFarlane and several other high-profile illustrators, was a venue for creator-owned properties, in which comic creators could publish material of their own creation without giving up the copyrights. You see, at that time, the bigger publishing companies like Marvel Comics or DC Comics, their creators were considered work-for-hire. So all of the content that they created, they created for Marvel Comics or DC Comics. They they didn't keep the copyrights. Now, Image Comics was immediately successful, and it remains to this day one of the largest comic book publishers in North America. In his new company, Todd immediately released his longtime creation named Spawn. The comic was a success, with fans drooling over the artwork Todd was so respected for, and a storyline that had depth and intrigue. It seems being murdered and brought back to life as a vengeful warrior with newfound powers well, that was something teenagers wanted. In 1993, when Todd put out the call to some industry legends to write an issue and create new characters for him, his clout got him a reply from Neil Gaiman. Having Neil on board was a complete boost to Image and to Todd's comic Spawn. Neil was riding high on the success of his graphic novel series, The Sandman. This series, which tells the tale of an ageless personification of dream, also, he had a bunch of names, but he was also called Morpheus. It became one of DC's top-selling graphic novels, eclipsing even Batman and Superman. Comic historian Les Daniels, he called Gaiman's work astonishing and noted that Sandman was a mixture of fantasy, horror, and ironic humor such comic books had never seen before. Gaiman changed the game, and in doing so, created an influx of new readers to the medium people who never picked up a comic before. And I can tell you from personal experience, this series, it's, it's well worth reading. So after Todd and Neil had set down the terms of their agreement, now this agreement was basically Todd wanted Neil to write issue number nine, and in return, 
Neil would co-own any characters created with Todd, as well as receive royalties to the issue, its reprint, any graphic novels, and any toys in which the characters were used. With all seemingly set, Neil created two characters, Angela and Cogliostro, as well as a medieval version of Todd's spawn. The issue did very well, and these characters had several further appearances in the comic series, and Cogliostro was also featured in the live-action movie of Spawn in 1997. It's a god-awful movie, don't watch it, but anyway. Now all of this seemed rosy for a little time. Todd was providing payments of royalties to Neil, but this suddenly dried up. On February 14, 1999, Neil received a letter from Todd announcing that Todd was officially rescinding any previous offers that he placed on the table. The letter offered Neil the following deal on a take-it-or-leave-it basis. Neil would relinquish all rights to Angela in exchange for the rights to a comic book character called Miracle Man, and all rights to Medieval Spawn and Cogliostro would continue to be owned by Todd McFarlane Productions. It was a completely bullish tactic meant to intimidate Neil into giving away his rights. But like the hero protagonist he admired, Neil was not one to shy away from a fight. He was a product of an industry where good triumphs over evil. And Todd? Well, to Neil, he was certainly acting evil. In 2002, Neil filed a lawsuit against Todd. And Todd countersued back. To bankroll this expensive fight, Marvel Comics joined Neil, and together they went after the rights to Angela and Cogliostro. Now, there was also a secondary fight over the other aforementioned character, Miracle Man. Now, see, Todd, this, this is another confusing one, because Todd was part owner of this as well, but he offered it to Neil, but he didn't have full rights to do so. Because of all the backstory of this issue, the judge threw out this argument, and he left the sole focus on the Spawn characters that were created for issue number nine. Further to this, Medieval Spawn, well... That character wasn't in dispute. It was basically a riff on Todd's original character, and neither party really argued about this. As with every lawsuit, days quickly turned into weeks, and weeks stumbled into months, and months turned into years. Ten years, to be precise. During this time, Todd presented many cross-arguments to the court, but they held little legal standing. The court, in this case, would side with the good guys, and render a sizable judgment against Todd and Image Comics. And further to this, a jury granted Neil joint ownership of two issues of Spawn, the Angela spin-off miniseries, and the disputed characters. Much of the last decade's worth of legal wrangling involved trying to determine how much money was made off these creations, and whether Gaiman also deserved ownership of other characters like Dark Ages Spawn and Tiffany and Domina which, in time, the judge also agreed should be included. The verdict was a complete victory for Neil. He had vanquished his foe and set the comic book world right. For Todd, it was a defeat that would take the shine off the crown of the once king of comics. But unknown to the casual fan of this medium, who may have indulged in the circus that was this decade-long court battle, something bigger than Neil and Todd came out of this something that would impact all artists of the genre, and even outside the medium. You see, the judge in this case, Judge Posner, he crafted a ruling that had implications for anyone who looked to collaborate with other artists. I've put a link to the ruling in the show notes, and I really think you should have a look at it, as it's a very interesting read in regards to copyright. I'll let Neil speak about this to give you an idea of what this verdict meant. Neil says this, The main thing is, I feel like an awful lot of good things came out of this decision. I think the various decisions, particularly the Posner decision, were huge in terms of the nature of dual copyright in comics. What is copyrightable in comics is now something that there is a definite legal precedent set for. Neil goes on to say this, There were a lot of things that were misty in copyright law that are now much clearer, and it's of benefit to the creator. It's now case law. Truthfully, I think all the decisions were incredibly good for all kinds of copyright. Now the statute of limitations begins with the discovery of the violation. You can't secretly file a copyright on someone else's things. Now to me, countless artists owe a debt of gratitude to Neil for not letting this seemingly simple agreement fall by the wayside. Neil could have easily walked away from the argument, 
saved himself a pile of money and ten years of his life. But like all heroes, he fought a good fight against injustice despite overwhelming odds. And for that, we're all benefactors. So now we come to the end of the episode. We've heard about the real struggle of artists when faced with a mobbed-up record producer, a credit-robbing Svengali, and an artist who felt he was above copyright law. Some of these artists won, but most of them lost more than they ever gained. Lessons were learned by trials of fire that left permanent scars on those burned by their intensity. As I mentioned in the opening, there are real dangers for all artists when it comes to the business of your career. It should be crystal clear to all of you listening that it's wholly ignorant to give little weight or anything less than 100% focus when signing any contract. These binding agreements, which can number in the hundreds of pages, well, they can overflow with pitfalls that only serve to trap the artists into accepting less than they're worth. But far too many artists find themselves signing on the dotted line out of some fear that they will never see such interest in them again. Don't believe me? Just do a quick Google search for bad music deals and you'll see pages of results that provide detailed lists of talents that are drowning in data, void of creator ownership and facing years of court battles just to be free from the deal. Now don't fool yourself into thinking that these artists have nothing to do with you, that they were simple fools to get into such a situation and that you would always do better. That's just your ego talking. And it's the same ego these artists had. The truth is that the process of creating and getting paid for your art, or design, or performance, or book, or film, there are always a multitude of people between you and that paycheck. Everyone wants a piece of the pie. And if any one of these parties decides that they didn't get their fair shake, well, my friend, you could easily find yourself sitting across the table from a team of lawyers just waiting to bleed you dry. For an example of this, I just read about a lawsuit that was filed by an art buyer, and this buyer paid millions of dollars for a sculpture. But it appears the buyer wasn't provided the work in a reasonable timeline by the gallery. So now the gallery and the artist have become defendants. It appears the artist had no idea that the gallery didn't deliver, and he had no part of the transaction. But regardless of his lack of involvement, he's still named in the suit. So now everyone has to spend thousands of dollars and countless hours giving depositions, hearing counter-arguments, phone calls, and meetings, and ugh, the many meetings they're going to have to attend, all in a vain attempt to avoid the inevitable reality that someone's going to have to pay. And for his sake, let's hope that the artist involved isn't the one left holding the bag. That's a crazy story, right? A simple transaction that blew up into a multi-million dollar cause? Bet that artist never saw it coming. I also bet the artist didn't see the inevitable social media backlash. Now this backlash will most likely push down the price of his art just to appease the ever-demanding public. They know how to capitalize off fear. Who knows what the real cost will be when all is said and done? So I ask you, has this episode left you feeling exposed or suddenly and acutely aware that your business acumen is less than stellar? Do contracts appear to be written in some ancient language? Are you unsure of the difference between a consideration and a condition? Hell, would you even know if you're being taken advantage of by an agent or a manager by simply looking at a balance sheet? Well, lucky for all of us, there are things you can do today to protect yourself from such calamity. Now, this is never going to be a 100% antidote. There are just too many people who love to litigate. But it's the best step you can take to lessen the risk. So now you're saying... Well, what is that step? That's a simple answer. Join a guild or a similar nonprofit organization dedicated to protecting and preserving the medium you work in. That's it. Join a group that has your interest at the core of their commitments. A simple search can yield you the appropriate association for your chosen field of work. But for example, in the U.S., we have the Screen Actors Guild, and that's obviously for actors. We have the Authors Guild for writers. And for designers and painters and digital artists, there's the Artist Guild. Each of these organizations is a safe and effective resource for all creative types to educate themselves on contract laws or get references for agents or management. You know, these people have a solid reputation in the industry. Regardless of where you are in your career, these groups are there for you. 
And now, some are going to require membership fees to fully access their tools? You'll find very few who would argue that they aren't worth the investment. Ultimately, you're investing in your future, and depending on where you live, you can most likely write off this expense when tax time rolls around. Just make sure you have an accountant who knows about self-employment regulations. Now, before I wrap up, I just had a passing thought. If any of you are thinking that you don't need guilds or professional guidance because you can use your serious Google skills to replace the decades of experience they offer and save yourself a few bucks in the process, well, take a second and reconsider your utter foolishness. Sure, you may be one hell of a negotiator. You may understand contracts. And hell, you may even have a business degree from a leading institution. And, and all that's great. But let's remember what your job is. You're here to create great art. You're not here to spend your days sifting through contracts or financial documents. But as we all have learned, it's always important to keep one eye on the books. And remember what Andy Warhol said. Making money is art. Working is art. And good business? Well, that's the best art. Okay, I want to thank you for listening. And I do hope you've learned something from this episode. There was a lot to take in from these stories. For those of you who've left me amazing feedback on iTunes, to know that I've helped anybody in any way is so humbling for me. For those of you who may not have left reviews or ratings, that's okay. Please continue to listen and subscribe. Tell your friends on whatever social media platform you frequent. The great news is the show's been a number one top podcast in the U.S. iTunes art category many times this month because of you. So a big thank you. Now stop listening to me and go join a guild. Protect yourself. Thanks.